different from the talks you've heard so far. For one thing, um, I don't work in physics. My primary research is in epistemology, which has to do with, among other things, how uh, the evidence we might uh, gather in favor of a particular hypothesis or theory relates to our epistemic attitude uh, towards that hypothesis or theory. So my talk's gonna be a little bit more basic than the ones um, you've heard so far. The sort of general question I'm going to be um, concerned with is uh, thinking about how to rationally consider the question of God's existence and in particular, I'm going to be interested in two main questions. The question for today is going to be, um, how do arguments that sort of purport to show a particular probability for God's existence relate to the question of whether we should believe in the existence of God or not? Um, and then the uh, question for tomorrow is going to be, what is faith and how does this uh, relate to um, other epistemic attitudes, um, and in particular, how does it relate to our epistemic duties towards gathering evidence, um, considering counter arguments, and so forth. Um, so the a central theme is going to be that uh, one's epistemic duty in the matter of God's existence, what evidence one takes into account, what one takes that evidence to imply, and whether one looks for more evidence, depends on the purpose for which one is answering the question. Now, um, I'm sort of in agreement with Sean that uh, the hypothesis of God's existence is a hypothesis like any other. So there's nothing sort of particularly special about religious questions and how we should approach them. I sort of favor um, approaching all uh, questions kind of in the same spirit. But as we're going to see, uh, the purposes for which you're answering a particular question is go are going to make a difference to how you want to approach that question. Um, so some of you may be familiar with uh, various arguments that come from physics or other sources for and against God's existence. And a lot of these arguments um, use probabilities. So for example, Sean mentioned the fine tuning argument. Uh, this argument is supposed to show that it would be really unlikely that the physical constants are what they are if there wasn't a creator. And if there is a creator, it's really likely that the physical constants are what they are. So that's sort of an example of a probabilistic argument for God's existence in physics. There are also sort of more ordinary probabilistic arguments for God's existence. Um, you may be familiar with a uh, kind of reasoning that many people who believe in God um, suggest. They might say something like, well, I know there's a God because it's really unlikely that this thing would have gone exactly as it went in my life if God uh, didn't exist. So that's like a kind of evidence people use in favor of God's existence. Um, so what I'm interested in is the general question of the relationship between probabilistic arguments on the basis of the evidence, namely, um, given the evidence, there's a certain probability of um, some hypothesis and uh, the question of whether we should outright believe that hypothesis, given the evidence. Um, and you know, in the special case of God, how do arguments that we should assign a particular probability to God's existence bear on whether we should believe that God exists? OK, um, so the central claims I'm going to make in the, this talk, uh, four different claims. Uh, first, that in fact, a rational agent's creedal state, which I'll talk about in a second, but this has to do with the probabilities a rational agent assigns to various hypotheses, is not enough to fix her belief state. So there's no formal relationship between the probabilities you assign to various hypotheses and whether you should believe them. So sort of given this, you might think, well, uh, one of these concepts is bad. We can do away with it. But uh, unfortunately, if you think that, um, Next two claims, first, that uh, personal action is guided by a norm that relies on credence, that relies on this probabilistic kind of reasoning, and we sort of um, can't do without it. Uh, but also, moral judgment is guided by a norm that relies on belief, this other kind of reasoning, and we can't do without it. So in fact, both of these notions are necessary, but they're not formally related to each other. There are uh, two different kinds of questions about each proposition. What credence you should have in that proposition and whether you should believe it. And the evidence that's going to be relevant to each of these um, might be different depending on the purposes for which you're answering it. So um, some preliminaries. Uh, there are two important epistemic notions here. The first is belief. And this is the sort of 
familiar folk notion. You're all uh, familiar with the idea that you believe some things and don't believe other things. So um, not going to say much more about that. Uh, the other important notion is credence. And this is a semi-technical notion. It's sometimes expressed as uh, degrees of belief. Um, and here's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, so of course, there are lots of things you believe. Um, you believe that it's going to rain in Oxford tomorrow. Maybe you also believe that it's going to rain in California tomorrow. Um, but you might notice that some of these things you believe more strongly than others, or some of these things you're more confident in. So you are um, more confident that it's going to rain in England tomorrow than that it's going to rain in California tomorrow. And the way that uh, philosophers like to formally express this is by saying that you assign a higher degree, degree of belief to the proposition that it will rain in England tomorrow than you do to the proposition that it will rain in California tomorrow. Um, and in fact, uh, we can get sort of very precise and note that for rational agents, these degrees of belief or credences um, ought to behave like probabilities. So for example, um, if you assign a certain credence to a proposition, then you ought to assign 1 minus that credence to its negation. So if you assign credence 0.8 to uh, the proposition that it will rain in England tomorrow, you ought to assign 0.2 to the proposition that it won't rain in England tomorrow. Um, and Sean mentioned uh, Bayes' theorem. That's another kind of example of part of the probability calculus. Rational credences um, ought to obey Bayes' theorem. So we can sort of say systematically what happens when you get more evidence. Um, you update your credences by conditionalizing on that evidence. Um, so for example, if you um, have a credence, uh, your credence that it will rain in England tomorrow, given that the sky is gray is 0.9, and you notice that the sky is gray, then you ought to um, assign credence that it will rain in England tomorrow as 0.9. Okay. So another fact about rational credences is that um, in certain cases, certain special kinds of propositions come uh, associated with objective chances. So for example, um, if we have a fair coin, the objective chance that the coin will land head, heads is 0.5. Um, when, we, when there are known objective chances, your credences ought to line up with these. So um, you ought to assign a credence of 0.5 to the proposition that some particular fair coin will land heads. We can also choose to believe or disbelieve certain objective chance propositions. So for example, um, the proposition that there is a 50% chance of this coin landing heads. That's the object of, of belief. You can either believe it or not. Um, there are also these other things that we might refer to as epistemic chance propositions. Um, people have sort of different ways of cashing out what these are, but the idea is that there's some claims we make about chance that um, aren't sort of associated with some kind of objective um, mechanism that, that determines what happens. So if you say, like, there's a good chance that I'll skip work tomorrow, it's not as if you're expressing, like, the universe flips some kind of coin, and you know likely what happens is the coin comes up a certain way, and you don't go to work. What you're sort of expressing is, like, given the evidence I have sort of in in situations like this, you know, 70% of the time I make it to work, something like that. So that has like kind of the exact same character as the objective chance propositions, but that aren't actually associated with like some physical underpinnings that we assign chance to. Okay, um, so finally, uh, just sort of spelling out what we mean by rational in this context. Rational agents are agents who form beliefs and credences on the basis of the evidence. So. One initial thought you might have about this kind of framework is that credence is just a way to make more precise this notion of belief. Um, and in fact, belief is reducible to credence. Credence is just like this um, better, more precise way of talking about the same thing. Um, but that, uh, so one of the sort of main um, points of this talk is uh, to argue that that's not, in fact, the case. In fact, belief and credence are going to be re responsive to different features of evidence. Um, but just to sort of go through a couple like um, kind of initial views that seem plausible, uh, the first view is what's known as the certainty view. Uh, this just says that uh, belief that P is equivalent to having a credence of 1 in P for a rational agent. So you might 
This is sort of suggested by the notion of like degrees of, of belief or, or partial belief. You might think, well, like um, I have these degrees of belief. Believing to degree one is like believing all the way. That's just believing. Um, I'm not going to sort of argue in detail against this view. I'm mostly just going to assume that it's false. But let me just tell you a couple worries that people have about it that's sort of um, behind uh, thinking it's false. Now, of course, maybe there are ways to like push, push back against these worries. I'm not going um, to do that here. But the, the sort of main two worries are first that um, believing something shouldn't mean that you're certain of it. So there are lots of things you believe um, that you're not certain of. And along these lines, uh, ordinarily, uh, credences are associated with betting behavior. So in fact, some people um, define credences in terms of betting behavior. So like you have credence um, 0.8 that it will rain tomorrow just in case you're willing to take a bet at um, uh, you know, four to five odds that um, it, it will rain tomorrow and so forth. Um, if you have a credence of one in something, then that means that you're willing uh, to risk any finite amount of money um, in exchange for just like some little bit of money if the thing is true. But it seems like there are lots of things you believe um, on which you're not willing to bet everything. And in fact, that seems like a rational attitude. So these are just sort of considerations against this sort of simple idea that um, belief is like maximal credence. Um, so a slightly more plausible view is what's known as the threshold view. And the threshold view says that there's some value such that a rational agent uh, believes a proposition P if and only if uh, her credence exceeds this value. And maybe um, T is vague, but this is just sort of with the idea that like once something has a high enough probability, uh, you just outright believe it. Um, now there's sort of classic problem with this view, I'm not going to rest anything on the problem, but just to mention it, um, that's the lottery paradox. So it seems like however you set the threshold, so let's say we set the threshold at um, 0.95, you can come up with a set of propositions such that you appear to believe them all, um, but also appear to disbelieve their conjunction. So um, consider a lottery with um, 30 lottery tickets. Uh, and consider the proposition ticket one will lose, the proposition ticket two will lose, the proposition ticket three will lose, et cetera. Um, for each of these lottery tickets, you set its credence at above 0.95. So on this view, you believe each of these propositions. Um, but presumably, you also believe that one of the tickets will win. So you don't believe the conjunction you know, ticket one will lose, and two will lose, and, and three will lose, et cetera. Um, again, I don't want to rest too much on this. Uh, uh, problem because uh, various people have um, sort of come up with ways to argue that this, this is OK or that maybe like um, the threshold sort of changes with uh, different contexts and so forth. Um, but just to sort of mention that. Um, and a, a modification of this view is the idea that um, the threshold does depend on the stakes or the context. So the view is that for given stakes and or context, there is some threshold such that a rational agent believes P if and only if her credence exceeds that threshold. And um, this, this sort of main motivation for this view is like to, considering cases in which um, there are higher stakes involved in your believing something. So you might think if it's like a really, really uh, important proposition on which I'm basing a really important decision, um, I don't believe it unless I'm like really sure. But maybe some things that don't matter that much, I, I don't need to be that confident to count as believing it. OK, so these are sort of some standard views. Um, but I'm going to argue that these are all false. In fact, I'm going to argue that there can't be a formal relationship between belief and credence. OK, so um, the way to start approaching this um, is to think about uh, some kinds of cases that have caused some problems for legal scholars, and then to think about how cases like this uh, relate to the problem of belief and credence. And um, I should say that like this particular kind of feature that I'm going to spend most of the talk talking about, it's not like clear how this relates to um, belief and credence in God's existence. But then I'm, I'm going to sort of use this to argue that there's no formal relationship. And then I'm going to um, mention some other ways in which we might 
press against the idea that there's a formal relationship between belief and credence that in fact are kind of directly relevant to God's existence and explanation. But I think like this kind of case helps us see um, pretty clearly what the role of each is. And then we can sort of like infer um, from that the sort of important facts about the arguments for and against God's existence. OK. So um, in, the, uh, in the American legal system, there are different kinds of uh, court cases that have different standards. One kind of case um, is a civil case. And the sort of rough idea behind a civil case is, is that in order to prove your case, um, you have to the idea is supposed to be that, that, that you have to establish that the fact is more likely than not. Um, and this is usually taken to mean like uh, probability above 0.5 if we're doing this kind of reasoning. But here's a kind of case that um, legal scholars have sort of talked about that uh, pushes against this idea. So, so here's the puzzle. Um, suppose it's late at night and an individual's car is hit by a bus. Um, the individual can't identify the bus, but she can establish that it is a blue bus and she can prove as well that 80% of the blue buses in the city are operated by the blue bus company, that 20% are operated by the apparently mislabeled red bus company, um, and that there are no buses in the vicinity except those operated by one of these two companies. Um, moreover, each of the other elements of the case, negligence, causation, and especially the fact and the extent to the injury, is either stipulated or established to a virtual certainty. OK, so um, in this case, we have um, uh, a statistical regularity having to do with how often uh, a bus is likely to be in a particular environment. So if we were, um, we can sort of say pretty obviously that the probability that uh, the woman was hit by a bus from the blue bus company is 0.8, and the probability that she was hit by a bus from the red bus company um, is 0.2. Uh, but in fact, as, so this is sort of much higher than 0.5, and you would think that this is su sufficient to um, uh, you know, meet the preponderance of evidence standard. But in fact, uh, the court will find in this case that the, the, uh, uh, the uh, plaintiff has not established that the blue bus company is, is, has um, hit the individual. OK. Um, but in fact, we could imagine a similar case in which the probability is, in fact, lower, but in which the verdict would be in favor of the bus company. So um, this is the green bus case. Suppose it's late at night and an individual's car is hit by a bus. Um, the two bus companies in the area, the green bus company and the yellow bus company, each operate 50% of the buses. The individual identifies the bus as belonging to the green bus company. It's nighttime, and so her color vision is not ideal. Let us say she makes mistakes 30% of the time. All of the other elements of the case remain the same. Um, so it's pretty easy to figure out here that um, in this case, the probability that the individual was hit by the green bus is 0.7. Um, so in fact, the credence in the blue bus case is higher than the credence in the green bus case. Um, but it seems like uh, they appear to license the following court verdicts. Uh, a no verdict in the case of the blue bus, um, but yes verdict in the case of the green bus. Um, so it seems like we have a situation in which we have sort of two um, analogous cases, one in which we actually assign higher probability to the um, guilt of the defendant, um, but in which we don't get a verdict, and the other in which we have a lower probability, but we do have a verdict. Now, I don't want to rest too much on court verdicts, because um, maybe there's sort of not a clear-cut relationship between belief and verdicts. Um, but sort of, we might say, intuitively, just as I've described the case, case to you, um, it seems like you're going to um, not believe that the blue bus hit the individual in the first case, but you are going to believe that the green bus hit the individual in the second case. And maybe if you think like the probabilities are just like both too low, um, you can sort of raise the probabilities in both cases. And it seems like you can get a case in which um, we have a higher probability of the blue bus, lower probability of the green bus, but you believe that the green bus um, hit the individual. And here's another kind of case. Um, so you come into the, you've left the room for a little bit. Um, you come back and find that your iPhone has been stolen. There were only two people in the room, Jake and Barbara. Uh, you have no evidence about who stole the phone, but you know that men are 10 times more likely to steal iPhones than women. Just a st statistic I made up, don't worry. Um, 
Uh, so in this case, it seems like you have really good statistical evidence um, that Jake uh, stole the iPhone. Um, you ought to assign a high probability or high credence to the claim that Jake sto stole the iPhone. But it doesn't seem like you ought to believe that Jake stole the iPhone. Um, analogous case, you again find your iPhone has been stolen. Such a shame you bought a new iPhone and left it alone again and came back to find it's been stolen. Um, there are only two people in the room, Jake and Barbara. Uh, you have no evidence about who is more likely to steal, but a somewhat reliable witness tells you she saw Jake take it. So it seems like in this case, even if you have a lower credence that Jake stole the iPhone, um, it seems intuitively uh, the information here does license the belief that Jake stole the iPhone. Okay, so what's going on here? How can we kind of explain this? Um, the sort of interesting fact is that statistical evidence generally produces a rational belief in a chance C that P proposition in a rational agent. So it produces, for example, the belief that 80% uh, that there is an 80% chance that it was a blue bus. It also presumably produces a rational credence of um, CR of P equals C that sort of via the relationship between known probabilities and credences. But it is often by itself not enough to produce a belief that P, even when C is very high. One explanation you might uh, give for this fact is that beliefs formed on the basis of statistical evidence, if true, are correct as a matter of luck, and the believer knows this. So um, kind of regardless of what color bus actually hit the woman in the first case, um, you're, it's you're equally well going to have the evidence 80% of the buses in the town are blue buses. However, if um, the, in the yellow bus, green bus case, it's just not the case that regardless of which bus hit the person, um, you're going to have the same evidence. In fact, you're just more likely to get the evidence of the witness saying um, it was a green bus. If it actually was a green bus, then if it wasn't, that's just what it means for the um, individual to be somewhat reliable. So, and another way to sort of put this is if you considered, let's say in each case it was the bus in question. So in the first case it was the blue bus, in the second case it was the green bus. Um, if you consider the counterfactual, if it hadn't been the green bus, I wouldn't have gotten this statistical evidence. That's false, but the counterfactual, if it hadn't been the green bus, I wouldn't have gotten the eyewitness evidence. That's in fact true. So that's sort of, um, we have this sort of intuitive fact, and here's like one way to explain it. It turns out that we actually can't read the difference between causation and correlation off the formal features of a probability function. So um, if I'm right that there's this difference that matters to whether or not you believe something, it's actually not going to be a difference that shows up in the, just in the credences you assign to various propositions. Um, <coughs> You need, uh, as we say, you need intervention, not just statistical correlation to determine causation. So again, if it's relevant to whether you should believe uh, whether you're, th what the causal character of your evidence is, um, then we're not going to be able to figure out whether you believe something just by reading it off your, um, your probability function, even if we consider like, other features of your uh, probability function, such as your cr conditional probabilities or um, Things like uh, how resilient your credence in some particular proposition is to new evidence. OK, so what these cases bring out is that rational credence and rational belief are sensitive to different features of evidence. Um, and we might notice that here's like an initially plausible sounding um, principle relating belief and credence. You might think uh, if one believes P, and one's credence in P increases, then one continues to believe P. Um, well, if I'm right about how statistical evidence operates, uh, this isn't true. So um, consider, again, the, the iPhone case. So um, let's say you have this statistical evidence that um, men are more likely to steal iPhones. So you currently have a credence 0.8 that, uh, or I don't remember the exact numbers, say 0.9 that Jake stole the iPhone, but you don't believe that Jake stole the iPhone. Now let's say you um, simultaneously learn that uh, this statistic is false, and you also learn that uh, an eyewitness um, says she saw Jake. Then what happens is your credence 
goes down. But in fact, now you believe um, that Jake stole the iPhone because although your credence goes down, you get evidence that's relevant um, to belief, whereas you had none before. OK, um, so here is kind of another, um, another puzzle about belief. And this is, is a little more directly related to um, the idea of uh, the idea that it's a good feature of a belief that it's explanatory. So um, when, you, when you have a, a bunch of propositions and you have like a, a credence in that set of propositions, and you add another proposition to this set and you want to know the credence of the resulting conjunction, um, the credence of all the propositions taken together gets lower as you add another proposition. Or at the very least, it doesn't get higher. It, it can stay the same. But in, in general, this is you know, just to say like the more facts you add, um, the less likely their conjunction becomes. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, other features that contribute to belief might be enhanced. For example, um, it might be that uh, some set of propositions taken together tells a coherent story. It might be that some set of propositions together has explanatory power, whereas um, they didn't kind of an individual proposition didn't have explanatory power. So this is another example um, in which your uh, credence can get lower, but um, as a result, you might believe something. So this is like um, counterexample to like sort of the inverse of monotonicity. If you don't believe P and your credence in P decreases, um, then you continue not to believe P. That's false because adding a belief to your set of beliefs um, could make the set of beliefs good in some way that um, even though it makes the total credence lower. OK, um, so one thing you, you might think here is, well, you know, of course there is no formal relationship because our sort of folk notion of belief is just um, horribly misguided. Uh, we ought to just stick with credence and probability. That's the like precise thing. Um, that's what really really interested in, and we have no use for the notion of belief. Or you might think, um, although those of us who work in formal epistemology think this is less plausible, um, in part because we like to hang on to our jobs, you might think that the notion of credence is horribly misguided. Um, so uh, what I want to argue next is that, in fact, both of these notions are essential to explaining how a certain um, type of action is justified. And so, and what, what's going to be interesting is um, to figure out how uh, to carve out the two domains in which each notion plays a role, because ultimately, um, then whether we're interested in the credence of a proposition or, or whether we should believe it, it is going to um, depend on kind of for what purposes we're considering the proposition. What domain um, does our consideration of the proposition figure into? Okay. Um, so the first uh, sort of thing I'm interested in, in uh, showing is that um, credence uh, figures in to one kind of justification. The central kind of justification it figures into is that of personal action. Um, so I should first say the important notion here is justification, not correspondence to the actual reasoning process um, because, you know, so... Uh, Given that credences are kind of a relatively recent invention and people have been reasoning for a long time, it, it would be sort of um, strange to think that they're like some conscious object of reasoning or something like that. Um, I should also say that uh, there is a debate in philosophy about whether it's belief-like entities or knowledge-like entities that justify action. Um, I'm not interested in taking a stand on that because um, this distinction cross-cuts the distinction between belief and credence. So um, if, so in either case, so there is sort of like credence states and then there are like credence states that constitute knowledge. And I'm not interested in like which of those things play the important role or belief states and belief states that constitute knowledge. I'm not interested in which of those things um, play the important role. What I'm interested in is um, which package of things uh, is going to do the work. Okay. So what I mean by a personal action decision is a decision about action where the only or primary stakes are for the individual decision maker. So um, paradigm example is, you know, you're playing poker, you're playing the stock market, um, but other sort of mundane decisions such as um, 
you know, you're deciding whether to bring an umbrella to work. Uh, so decision theory uh, is, is our sort of most um, precise theory of um, what it is to be instrumentally rational. So uh, what it is to be instrumentally rational is to take the means to your ends. But of course, in the ordinary situations in which we find ourselves, um, we often have a choice between um, one action that like has a low probability of getting us something we really want and another action that has like a high probability of getting us something um, we want but not as much. So um, we have to combine uh, how much we value the various outcomes which, with how likely we think various actions are to lead to these outcomes. Um, OK, so uh, our sort of standard theory of this is expected utility maximization. So roughly, you uh, pick the act that has the, higher av the highest average value, where the average is calculated by taking um, the values you assign to outcomes uh, weighted by how likely each outcome is. So the value of bringing an umbrella is like how um, bad it is to get wet times the probability of it raining plus um, how uh, not bad it is to stay dry and carry an umbrella. Um, or how bad it is to stay dry yeah, and not carry an umbrella um, multiplied by the probability of it not raining. OK, and it should be obvious the framework of this is credences. And it gives rise um, to the following norm, which we might call the credence norm of instrumental rationality. Uh, take the means which does the best in terms of getting you what you most value, given your credence in the relevant events. Um, so uh, credence uh, figures into sort of a very good, precise justification of um, rational action. But unfortunately, we cannot explain rational action just using beliefs, including uh, beliefs in chance propositions. Um, I see that I'm going to need to move a little quickly. So I don't, I'm not going to um, spend much time arguing for this. Uh, but we can talk about it more in Q&A. But one sort of basic idea that comes out of these um, statistical cases I've been talking about is that um, personal action might be thought of as um, taking a bet of a certain sort. Um, and in the statistical cases, how you should bet comes apart from how you should believe. So you ought to bet that it was the um, blue bus in the blue bus case. In fact, you ought to um, spend more money betting that it was a blue bus in the blue bus case than betting that it was a green bus in the green bus case. Because you know, guess what? In the blue bus case, four times out of five, you're going to be right. Um, in the green bus case, fewer times. So, um, but uh, again, you lack belief in the blue bus case, and you have belief in the green bus case. So we can't say, for example, um, that you ought to uh, do the action that's best given what you believe. Because um, if that's right, then um, that would say that you ought to bet more money on the green bus than on the blue bus, but that's false. In other words, uh, there isn't a belief norm of instrumental rationality. So such a norm would have to say something like, uh, action A is more desirable than action B if, and then give some condition about the desirability of A and B, and some condition about um, my epistemic state that doesn't mention desire. Um, but again, there isn't going to be a, a norm like this. So importantly, when we're thinking about what the right action to do is, we don't separately think about which thing is best, and then kind of choose which thing is best, and then take the act that has the highest probability of getting us that. Um, that just doesn't sort of correctly predict what we ought to do. What we, what we do is we can consider both of these things together. We consider um, how good a particular outcome is and how likely an act is to get me that outcome. We like take an average or do something and then um, make, make the comparison. So there's not like so two separate conditions that you have to satisfy. And if they're jointly satisfied, you should do that act. Um, rather, there's one condition that um, treats both of the elements, the sort of uh, desirability element and the epistemic element separately. I just argued that we need credence 
I'm now going to argue that we also need belief, and in fact, we need belief in a very particular domain, namely that of moral judgment. Um, so in many cases, I am called on to take a yes-no stand. Uh, go back to the jury case, a jury is called on to give a yes-no answer about whether a particular defendant is guilty or not, uh, formed only on the admissible evidence, and it is on that basis that the defendant is punished. Now, we could actually imagine a different legal system uh, that punishes defendants in proportion to the jury's credence in the defendant's guilt. So um, we can imagine a jury saying, well, on the basis of the evidence, we're like strongly sure the person did it, or like medium sure, or we don't know, or we're pretty sure they didn't. Um, and we might punish the person in proportion to that, uh, that verdict, um, you know, give them more jail time if the person is more certain. And in fact, this actually would maximize our expected value if um, there's like some positive value that attaches to putting a guilty person in jail and some negative value that attaches to putting an innocent person in jail. Um, so in fact, uh, we could imagine some plausibility of this system, but um, that's not the system. I, I don't think that's anyone's system and not for merely uh, practical reasons. Similarly, in making moral judgments, I'm called upon to assign or withhold praise and blame, to feel guilt and shame, and so forth. Um, whether to do so is an all or nothing decision based on what I believe about the facts concerning another person or about whether my own act was permissible. Um, so, you know, for example, I uh, consider how bad shoplifting is, and then I consider whether a person, particular person shoplifted, and if I believe that they did, then I assign um, the requisite amount of um, blame to that person. So, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the, while the degree of blame I assign to a particular agent is based on the severity of, act, of the act, um, it's not based on your credence that she, in fact, did it. So we could imagine a system of um, personal judge, judgment in which uh, you did sort of blame, uh, blame someone based on, like, uh, the average credit, uh, the average uh, blame you should apportion them given their, their uh, given your credences. Um, for example, uh, let's say you have one uh, friend and you have a credence of 0.9 that she shoplifted. That's an act that's like kind of bad, but not that bad. So um, you would give her like some amount of blame. And you have this other friend who you have a like 0.01 credence um, that they murdered someone. Now that's a really, really bad act. So if you were sort of doing this calculus where the, um, the judgment element and the credence element interacted, um, then in fact this second person would be the person that you blame more. But you don't, because the way our norm works is that is these two elements are separate. You first figure out um, how severe the act was, and then you decide yes or no, uh, was this does this person deserve condemnation for the act? Um, and if the answer is yes, they get all the condemnation, sort of regardless of um, how high your credence is. So we have a, it seems like we have a belief norm of moral judgment, blame someone only if you believe or know that she did it, and blame her in proportion to the severity of the transgression. Uh, but we lack a credence norm of moral judgment, blame someone in accordance with the expectation of how severely she transgressed, given your credence that she did it. Um, OK, so of course, uh, personal action and moral judgment don't exhaust uh, the, the domains of human activity. So given that we've sort of located a primary space for each of these epistemic notions, um, we might ask, OK, so uh, how, do the, how is the full domain divided up? Um, and we might first notice that there's some, some overlap in these two things. I won't mention all of these, but one thing that seems really important is these cases in which uh, there's sort of both a personal action and a moral judgment. So in the case of the blue bus, um, there's a question about what you ought to believe. And we might also ask you to bet on um, which bus it was. So in that case, uh, what you believe or how you find is different from how you bet. Uh, we also might consider an example in which, let's say we have a, a shopkeeper um, who has an interest in um, you know, making sure nothing gets stolen from his store, and he knows that like 
90% of uh, teenagers shoplift or something pretty high. Um, another statistic I made up for purposes of this talk. Um, so we uh, consider the act of the shopkeepers keeping a special eye on the teenager. Um, I think we're actually torn about this act because on the one hand we think like from the point of view of him just trying to uh, do what's best for his shop, something that's like totally permissible for him to care about, he ought to keep an eye on the teenager. But insofar as keeping an eye on a teen the teenager um, is like making the assertion this teenager is guilty or this teenager is a bad person or something, we think like he ought not keep a special eye on the, the teenager because he like, he shouldn't believe that that particular teenager is a shoplifter. So um, it's important that there are, uh, there are certain actions that can be considered uh, from the point of view of like both of these domains. And I think those are precisely the actions in which we actually feel attention about what the person ought to do. And so I think um, the fact that, that uh, belief and credence figure into different norms and that there's no formal relationship between them actually sort of explains this tension that we feel. The uh, important way to sort of finally carve up the domain between um, acts to which uh, one's credence is the relevant thing and acts to which one's belief is the relevant thing are these two different kinds of reasoning, deontic reasoning and consequentialist reasoning. Um, so uh, roughly uh, in consequentialist reasoning, you are thinking, um, not just about sort of yes or no facts, you're thinking um, kind of like how do, how do we, how to weigh up the um, different consequences with, with the likelihoods that they'll obtain. So um, that's sort of exactly what you're doing in the personal action case, but some cases of um, moral decision making of course also use consequentialist reasoning, so consider a doctor uh, figuring out which drug to uh, prescribe his patient. Clearly what's relevant in that case is like um, which drug does better on average, right? So like belief needn't come into it at all. Um, uh, so uh, it seems like whenever you're doing consequentialist reasoning, what's relevant is the probabilities. Um, and the reason that's relevant is consequentialist reasoning takes the, the value uh, piece of the puzzle and the epistemic piece of the puzzle and they can't be cleanly separated in our norm. They sort of, um, uh, they interact. But when we're doing deontic reasoning, when we're sort of figuring out like uh, yes or no, should you judge this person, um, uh, the belief part and the uh, value part don't interact. They're sort of like a separate question about what value to assign to this thing, and then there's like a yes or no question about whether we believe that the conditions have been met. Okay, so how does all of this apply to arguments about uh, God's existence? Well, it seems like um, they're sort of what we've been, what we generally consider in uh, philosophy of religion or just in sort of uh, consideration about uh, whether God exists is a single question, namely what epistemic attitude should we take towards God's existence? Um, but in fact, I think there are two questions here and they need to be untangled. So when we're asking whether a particular bit of information is evidence for God's existence, um, the question of whether it ought to raise one's credence that God exists is different from the question of whether it ought to count in favor of believing that God exists. Um, so, you might ask, well, which question are we really interested in? I think we're actually interested in both questions um, in different contexts. So uh, sometimes we're interested in the question for scientific and theoretical purposes, either um, kind of when you think about uh, general scientific reasoning, reasoning that's accessible to the entire scientific community, such as the fine tuning argument, or um, sort of more personal, kind of reasoning, uh, such as the reasoning, well, this thing that happened to me would be really unlikely to have happened if God didn't exist. Um, uh, and you're just sort of interested in like some abstract way in whether God exists without like caring about the question for any purposes except uh, factual informational purposes. Um, then I think what's relevant uh, are the credences. So 
all of the evidence that uh, goes into forming credences uh, can count in this domain. Um, and some of the evidence that uh, may be relevant to belief but not to credence, um, namely like how good a story does something tell, something like that, um, is not going to be relevant. Uh, why? Well, when we're uh, doing um, science and other kind of theory, there is little need to take a stand. Uh, in fact, uh, more precision is sort of better. So like uh, it's interesting. It, it's like a better conclusion that um, we ought to attach like this much credence to a particular scientific theory than that we ought to believe it because when you attach a particular credence, then we sort of know how to behave when we get more evidence for the theory. But if we just know like that we believe it or we don't, um, we're sort of not always, uh, we, we like lose some amount of precision. Uh, furthermore, it seems like scientific acts, gathering data, funding particular research and so forth are generally motivated by consequentialist considerations. So like one consideration that might lead you to um, uh, take on a research project is like uh, how uh, likely is this project to bear fruit and what sort of fruit will it bear if it does. Um, on the other hand, sometimes we consider the question of God's existence for what we, we might call moral purposes. Um, and in these cases, uh, there may be a need to take a stand. And so these, you know, uh, a lot of people think that it's like um, the question of whether or not you believe in God actually has um, moral import. So maybe that's like in to take a like sort of very uh, traditional Christian theology, like that's the thing uh, by which you're judged um, whether you go to heaven or hell, like that kind of thing. So um, here, uh, the deontological considerations are going to be important. Um, maybe sometimes consequentialist considerations are going to be relevant too. So um, in this domain, you're going to have to you know, uh, figure out, it's gonna, going to be like important what specific purpose are you um, asking the question for, but the sort of main point is that we ought to uh, separate um, the kinds of questions where uh, knowing the credence that you ought to assign to God's existence given the evidence is important from the questions to which um, knowing whether you ought to believe in God's existence given the evidence uh, uh, we have to separate. So we have to separate those two questions. So um, just to sort of this is um, mainly been a talk on thinking about how we ought to think about our evidence. But uh, the the sort of question to then send you out with is um, what is the character of our standard evidence for God's existence? So are there um, sort of particular arguments that uh, really are relevant in the credence domain but not in the belief domain and vice versa. And one place to think about this is, uh, in particular, is the fine tuning argument um, and the idea. So uh, Sean brought this up very briefly, but the idea that like we wouldn't uh, be here to see it uh, if, if there wasn't fine tuning, we wouldn't be here to ask, like, why is there fine tuning? Um, that kind of um, reasoning uh, brings up the like the causal relationship between our evidence and um, and uh, the truth of the proposition. So like that's the kind of reasoning that we might think is like relevant to the probability of God's existence, but not to belief in God's existence. So that's just like an example of a kind of place where this distinction might be relevant. All right, uh, questions?